Hello and welcome to the online service from Nambour Anglican Parish, South East Queensland, Australia. My name is Ralph Bowles. I'm the priest in charge of this parish in the Anglican Church, Southern Queensland. This service is a brief explanation of the Christian gospel, a brief act of worship, and we pray that in listening to it and watching it, you will find encouragement in your search for God, if you're searching for God, or in your relationship with God, if you want to express faith and hope. Here is a verse from the Apostle John to open our service today. From 1 John chapter 1. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. May God bless you today as you join your spirit with God's spirit in worship and fellowship. Well, I'd like to um, return to this, um, the third in this Advent series. Um, Advent is the season when we look to the coming of Christ and also to his second coming, his first coming and second coming. And you might have um, recalled that in that uh, reading from James, chapter 5, he has that startling sentence, the judge is standing at the door. The judge is standing at the door it means... Judgment is coming, it's close by, or the judge is actually listening very carefully to what you're saying about each other uh, in the context of James chapter 5. So I want to talk to you today about a serious subject, um, the final judgment. The judge is standing at the door. The theologians talk about the four last things, the four last things of history, the return of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of the dead, the final judgment, and then the new creation. And so we're up to number three in these uh, of the four in this series today. Um, you'll recall that uh, we often say in the Nicene Creed, he will come again, Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. So it's to fill out that idea that I want to um, invite you to think with me about this today, this uh, samba subject. It certainly is a, a topic that is talked about in the scriptures. It is clearly taught. Um, you might think of St. Paul uh, preaching his evangelistic message to the Athenian philosophers uh, on the Areopagus hill that day and he, um, he said uh, as his punchline of the sermon, God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Uh, you'll recall, uh, though I won't read it now, you'll recall the famous parable of Jesus, uh, the parable of the sheep and the goats, the final judgment scene, or St. Paul saying to the Corinthians, reminding them that we must all appear at the judgment seat of Christ. Um, so certainly it is a, a, uh, a doctrine taught very clearly in the scriptures and um, very somberly and vividly in that picture in the book of the Revelation to John chapter 20 um, verses 11 to 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated upon, on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, recorded in the books. The great picture of judgment. Um, now, um, a lot of people don't like this doctrine, this idea. Uh, people who um, are sceptical of the Christian faith don't like it a lot, or even inside the church. And there are others that like to um, modify the doctrine and take away its... Um, if you like, it's uh, uh, scary, scary aspects. Um, but there, and there are a lot of blurred and fuzzy ideas about it. Um, but the final, the final judgment, I think, is necessary for our for our sense of justice. Uh, I myself have never had a problem with it, as I, I'll explain in a minute. Um, 
it seems to me that if there is going to be God and a God who is ju just, then there must be some final settling of accounts and a final um, institution of justice, but I know that people don't like it. Um, there are a lot of unhelpful ideas about it, a lot of blurry, fuzzy ideas obscuring it, sometimes well-meaning, but um, not that very helpful. Um, you might recall that some years ago, um, um, technicians cleaned the, uh, the, f the dirt off the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, the fresco, the great fresco of Michelangelo on the top of the Sistine Chapel. Over the centuries, smoke from candles and all that um, uh, uh, had obscured the colours. It, it had a kind of dirty, what they call scumbling over it. And when they, um, when they took or, or removed the dirt of the centuries, they were surprised, everyone was surprised at the vividness and brightness of the colours that Michelangelo used. People hadn't seen, seen it in its original state with the beautiful colours. Now, I think a little bit like that about the doctrine of the final judgement. It's been obscured by the scumbling of, of fuzzy and incorrect ideas for centuries. Some of the, some of the um, poets and theologians of the Middle Ages added a whole lot of very lurid um, and frightening uh, uh, ideas to it. So uh, it's not surprising that the idea is uh, uh, not very favoured by people. Uh, people don't like it. But it is an important one. Now, so I would like just to take away a little bit today, try in a simple way to look at it. And in one sense, just like the Sistine Chapel colours, when you take away popular but false ideas of the final judgment, it's a lot brighter uh, a doctrine than people have thought about it. It's a lot more uh, positive a doctrine than you might think. Just a, a, a few things, a little proviso as I start, um, about the idea of judgment. Uh, in, our, in our English language and also in the New Testament, there are two related senses of the word judgment. Um, and they are actually in the Revelation 20 passage. The two ideas are there. First of all, judgment is a judicial investigation, trying to get the facts, trying to figure out what the real state of the case is. Now, we have that in our law in Australia, at least uh, in, in English and uh, European law, the idea that um, uh, a person accused of something should be regarded as innocent until proven guilty by proper examination of the facts. Um, and that when a matter comes, when a charge is laid or when a matter is coming to a court, everybody else should shut up, right? And not prejudge it not to um, get in, um, start making public statements about preempting the investigation. One would wish that some of the uh, politicians, media personalities and other people in Australia would um, recover this wonderful time-honoured principle because recent events in Australian legal circles have shown that um, uh, a, w a willingness to prejudge cases um, to the great harm of people's well-being and reputations um, is, a sh is a shocking thing, really. I think I'm not the only one, you may be too, uh, disappointed in some very vocal political and um, media personalities who ought to know better than the way they've behaved in recent times. Uh, really kind of disgraceful. But the principle is a good one. Um, have a proper investigation. And um, so judgment in that sense is in the Bible too. When the living and the dead come before the Creator, their Maker, the books are opened. The facts will be looked at first. Um, we have no capricious, biased judgment. Uh, as you know from um, history, that many, many times people have been called before tribunals where the government or the dictator or the king or whoever was in charge of the tribunal, had already decided what the outcome was going to be and um, was just going through the motions of a trial. 
the show trials of Stalin in those eras were like that. And uh, who knows today what happens in certain countries of the world when people come before a court and then are never heard of again and wonder whether they're getting a fair trial. So the principle of a proper investigation is there in the biblical idea of judgment. And then um, the second related idea is the idea of a verdict, a judgment. We have that in our, our, our tradition. A judgment is given. That means the judge or the court comes to a decision after looking at the evidence, hopefully carefully and fairly, and then issues a verdict, either acquittal or guilty. Uh, and that too is in Revelation 20, that second idea of judgment, that after the books are open and, exam uh, and the lives are examined, then there will be uh, an outcome, a verdict. Um, so there we are. Now, if you stand back and look at the uh, idea of the final judgment, it's probably not, you know, your favourite doctrine. Um, it is a sombre idea. But in one sense, um, it's a little bit brighter in the Gospel than people might think. And um, I'm not sure I've got the full essence of it here, but this is what, how I think about it. Be, uh, of it. it would be, um, we can guarantee, we can be confident that God will give us a fair judgment. All right, and it's there in chapter 20, verse 12. The books were opened. The facts will be looked at and will be judged by what we have done. And that, of course, includes our thoughts, our words, our actions. Um, and uh, we won't be judged because of the colour of our skin or our political opinions or our socioeconomic class or because some part, so God doesn't like us for some reason, mischievous, mysterious reason. Human people, when they make judgments, and uh, in plenty of evidence in history, often make judgments on other issues other than what people have done. You're a bad person because you're a member of this group, my enemy group. You vote for the wrong party. You have the wrong views. You're the wrong skin colour. All these things come in to influence or you're an enemy because you oppose what we, uh, we the government want to do therefore we will use uh, our power over you to sentence you and throw you away. Um, I mean our, our, our society has had a long, long hard journey to, 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 to establish that human beings coming before a human trial um, have the most protection to be judged fairly on what they've done according to the law, not because of um, some manipulation of the legal process. You know, the famous star chamber of the Tudor monarchs, you know, a, a mysterious court when you didn't know the, the full story, you know. If you ever read, Ka read the Kafka novels, Franz Kafka's great novel, The, the Trial, um, the, you must have been very depressed, Franz Kafka. Kafka. The, uh, the, Czech, the Czech writer from early 20th century. In the trial, a man is um, put up on a charge and he never gets to find out what the charge is or who's accusing him or what the evidence is. And it was like, a, it was written in the 1920s, it was like a prophetic picture of what was going to come for Europe of uh, dark, illegitimate tribunals and so on. Well, the judgment of God won't be like that. It will be fair and, um, and then elsewhere in the scriptures I think it says all mouths will be stopped. We won't have any complaints. We'll get a fair treatment. Now Paul, St Paul has a very good um, thoughtful exposition of the principles of judgment in Romans chapter 2. I won't go into them now but it's worth reading how he expounds it in Romans chapter 2. He says um, um, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed God will repay each person according to what they've done. Chapter 2, verse 7. Though To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory and honour and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Uh, there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. See, it's not racially organised. But glory, honour and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. God does not show favoritism. It's very good. Wonderful thing, really, because the ancient gods did show favoritism. 
They were capricious and biased, could not be trusted to act fairly. And here is the God of the Scriptures um, and so on. Now we know this will base, be based upon our thoughts, our words, the secrets of our heart, as Jesus said, so fair. That's the reason why for me personally, believing this, I've never had a great trouble with the idea of God as the, God the final judgment. Because whatever we think about it, I'm, I myself am convinced it will be fair. It would also be measured, nuanced, we might put it like this. Uh, and here is another stream of thought in the, in the scriptures about judgment. Um, the Lord as the judge will, I believe, take account of mitigating circumstances. He knows all. He will, he will hold us responsible, properly responsible, according to our level of responsibility and accountability. Now, Jesus has a parable. It's a bit of a kind of, it's one of those stark sort of parables, but the point, I think, is, is a good one. He says, the servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. It's a master-slave picture. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few, few blows. For everyone who's been given much, much will be demanded. From the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. The point, of course, is a fair one, and we have it in our legal system, that there are people who are not fully responsible or can't be expected to understand fully what they've done. There may be people whose mental state is confused and they don't, they, they're not responsible for their actions. Or people who are very young, children, who, um, who have much less responsibility. So this would apply in ways that we can't work out in detail, but the Lord will understand uh, for de the degrees of knowledge and responsibility um, will be taken into account, I trust. It's part of being a fair judgment. Um, and um, Paul talks about this also, as I've said, in Romans chapter 2. Um, there are people who have a sharper, clearer idea of what God wants them to do than others. And that, that, will, be the, that will be taken into account. Which brings us to the uh, other sombering somber point that um, Christian people will face, we all face an assessment of our life and service. Uh, we all appear too before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. The Lord will have a say to us about how we have served him. We have to understand that. This is a bracing um, doctrine and, um, and it's good that it's there. In other words, being forgiven in Christ, I'll get to that, is not a, a means that it doesn't matter what we've done as Christians. It, uh, that too will be taken into account and, and there will be, a, be a, a, an account of our stewardship given. Very important doctrine. Um, and the third one thing I want to mention today is about being merciful, the merciful judgment of God. And we must understand this. The Lord is merciful in his justice. Uh, he puts those two things together. Um, in fact, I think, I've felt, and I'm not the only one who's, who's observed, that as the doctrine of the gospel fades from our society, as the doctrine of grace and God's grace fades, uh, people are de detect detecting in public life an unmerciful vindictiveness to the failures of people. In other words, um, mercy, the decline of mercy in public life. Someone wrote a little article about it. Um, it's one of the signs that the gospel is being forgotten because certainly the God's justice is in the gospel, but God's mercy is in the gospel as, as well. We have a, a merciful judge. Um, um, yeah, he is, a, he is a merciful God and, and in his justice always remembers mercy. Um, so, of course, we know that there, there is the offer of pardon for the guilty. Pardon for the guilty. Um, uh, offering grace and forgiveness to us in Christ. And we remember that what, what is the gospel about, but the judge taking our punishment in our place. That, that, that's what Jesus did for us. Um, unheard of. Mercy. Um, amazing grace 
Um, that's the reason why Paul says in Romans 8, in Christ there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. No condemnation. We don't have to fear the, 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 the final judgment in that sense. Um, uh, there will be, of course, a facing, a facing of God, but we don't have to fear that. Uh, and um, for those people who have in their trajectory of their life, I'm getting a little bit off the side now, off the topic, um, because your mind is probably going there. There are those who have not heard of God and in, in in not had the knowledge of what we know, but in the trajectory of their life have indicated, will, will indicate what we would call faith and a pursuing of, 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 of the good, I think God will understand that in the judgment day too. The salvation of people outside the hearing of the gospel is a complex issue in its own, but I do think that, that will be, um, there is mercy there and understanding in that area. Now, um, the other thing I just want to say about that, in all this dis- decision about, or description in the Bible about facing the judgment of God, curiously, the actual judgment is not described what we don't have in the scriptures is what you might might have in Dante's Inferno you know lurid long pages of torture and pain and misery you know now I've got a lot of time for Dante right I've got his books I've read them great poet and all that but um if you can find in the scriptures a detailed explanation, a description of the nature of the judgment, please come and tell me. It's curiously not mentioned. Uh, and that's the reason why, because I believe in myself that it will be a merciful accounting. Um, but, you know, one has one's own ideas about these matters. Uh, and I just want to say... I know I've talked about this before, that the, uh, that the outcome of a person outside of salvation, outside of resurrection, is a final end to their existence. Um, it's symbolised in a graphic way in the um, book of Revelation as the destruction in the lake of fire. Um, but it simply means an end to our existence. Um, and uh, there's no life apart from God forever. We are not made immortal. Scripture doesn't teach that. We are born, uh, if you like to coin a word, someone coined the word, we are born immortable, immortable, able to become immortal through resurrection, but we are not born immortal. So to be to reject God or to be apart from God is finally to meet God and have your life assessed and then to pass out of existence. But I don't think the passing out of existence is part of the punishment. That's my... I don't believe that. Um, But that's a subject perhaps for another day. It's called, of course, the second death, which is an apt and simple description of it. Um, And if we... I know there are Christians and many theologians who want to find a way and believe that God... hope that God will find a way to bring everybody into his kingdom. Well, that would be lovely if that's the case. I don't believe the scripture teaches it. Um, but I can understand why people might want that to be the case. Um, indeed, but I don't believe it's actually taught. And in the end of the day, I don't believe the Lord will bring into his eternal kingdom people who don't want to be there. I don't think that he will make them come to a place they don't want to come. But that's another subject too. So um, there are the three qualities that I, uh, of these characteristics. Um, and again, I, I say there's a, a, a wonderful bright colour of mercy in the outcome of the final judgment. There is mercy that God does not continue in ex- people in existence, go on sinning and hating him. There's no mercy in that for, for the sinners or for, for, the, for the ongoing kingdom of God. So, um, we've said that. It will be a judgment to reveal how we've lived each day of our lives. That's a bracing thought, isn't it? The judge standing at the door. I've got just some, some reflection questions which we might, we might not have time to, 
toss them around now. But um, think about this. What difference to our lives would it make if we get rid of this doctrine of God's final judgment? Think about that. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. We hope it's been an encouragement to you for your spiritual life. If you'd like what we produce here, please subscribe to this channel. That'll be a great help to our ministry. And if you want to support us financially uh, by a donation, you can do so in the link below this video. Uh, and that donation goes through our website. Thank you for watching again. And we pray that you'll be encouraged in your understanding and knowledge of God. So thank you very much for being with us.